Hi everyone, um, welcome to this live stream. My name is Jenny McLean. Um, someone go ahead and let me know if you can hear me okay and everything's coming through. I'm gonna go ahead and get ready to share my screen here with you. Right. <clears throat> okay, so today we're going to talk about population dynamics um, and specifically carrying capacity and how that sort of impacts um, uh, ecosystems and organisms and how they, they live. So let's get moving right along with this. Um, in this stream, we're going to be uh, describing what carrying capacity is. We will look at the impacts of carrying capacity on ecosystems and explain how resource availability affects population growth over time. So to begin to talk about what carrying capacity is, we have to look at what is a um, population uh, and what does that exactly mean. So this is something that you've probably seen before in classes. Um, a population is all of the organisms of the same group or species which live in a particular geographical area. So we're gonna look at this document a little more here. Um, and what this is, is it's, I'm sure you've seen this before um, in other classes, maybe in biology. This is showing kind of the hierarchy or progression through out, uh, you know, our world and how things relate to each other. So it starts with an individual. So that's just one single animal or plant and then a group of the same species. So in this picture here is a, um, a bunch of elk, um, a group of elk living in the same geographical area would be a population of elk. Um, and then a, when you look at uh, elk interacting with moose and trees and rabbits and lions and stuff like that, that's going to be a community. So a community is all of the organisms interacting with each other. The ecosystem, that's going to be now looking at the cycling of matter and energy within that group. So how does nitrogen move, you know, through the elk and then through the trees and through the air and how does that all interact together? Um, a biome is those larger um, areas that are all kind of related through sim similar animals, um, temperature and climate. So you would have like the taiga biome or the desert biome, um, even though maybe one population of elk in uh, the, the forest biome is not going to interact with another population just because they're so far apart from each other. But the biome is um, an area that is the same because it has the same players in it, the same type of animals and the same types of plants and, and weather. Um, and then the whole thing together is the biosphere and how that would interact with the weather, moving um, energy from one place to another, moving things like um, water from one place to another. So that's kind of an overall um, of environmental science and where everything lays. But today we're going to look specifically at a population. So we're not talking about an individual um, so much, but a group of organisms of the same species that are in the same geographical area so that they can interact with each other. All right, so the first thing here, uh, looking at exponential growth. And exponential growth is what populations do when they are not inhibited by anything else. So populations grow at their intrinsic rate of increase, which is noted by lowercase r, and that's not limited by resources um, and increasing at a fixed rate each year. So let's break that down a little bit about what that means. So this just means a group of animals or plants that are in an area together, and they're going to increase at their intrinsic rate. Intrinsic means like personal. So the intrinsic rate of increase for a bunny versus an elephant would be very different. Um, you know, rabbits probably reproduce four times a year. Each time they can have large litters, you know, five to 10 babies. Um, so one female rabbit could potentially have 40 babies a year. Um, so their intrinsic rate of increase is going to be very fast. So if you had uh, five, you know, reproductive age female rabbits go loose into a new area that had everything they needed for life. Um, those five rabbits, you know, could have a hundred new rabbits by the end of the year. So they're going to 
intrinsically grow very quickly, whereas elephants, um, they don't begin to reproduce until they're much older, 10, 15 years old, and they're gonna have maybe a total of, of five babies. I'd say that'd probably be a lot in their lifetime. So if you had a group of five elephants that went into a new area where they were gonna live, um, they might have one new baby every year as they kind of grow. So the intrinsic rate is gonna be different for every single animal and that's um, just how um, many babies that they have. And our last presentation talked about um, K and R selected reproduction and that's exactly that. So the rabbit is gonna be R selected reproduction and they're gonna be able to reproduce very, very quickly. Um, and then K selected reproduction is gonna be much slower. So um, that kind of depicts what type of animals are gonna reproduce quicker and have a faster intrinsic rate of increase. Um, and again, this is when there's nothing slowing them down. There's enough food, nothing's hunting them, there's everything is good for them to just reproduce at their fastest possible rate that they could be going at. Um, and that is exponential growth. Move on here. So then the opposite, I guess, or what comes after exponential growth is going to be logistic growth. And for logistic growth, that has to do with what is happening to them once they hit their carrying capacity or come near to their carrying capacity. So in every ecosystem, they're gonna run out of something eventually. You're not gonna have unlimited food, unlimited space, unlimited water. Some resource is gonna to start to limit their ability to reproduce as fast as they can. Um, so when that blue line begins to slow down, that is when you're not seeing the population increase at its fastest possible rate or its intrinsic rate. It's beginning to slow down um, either because there's not enough space anymore. So in the, so the nesting birds, they have run out of space. And if you don't have space to build a nest, you can't have eggs, you're not gonna have any more babies. So that would be a space determining factor. The other picture is a, a mother moose with her two babies and they're being watched by a grizzly bear. So at some point you're gonna have so many prey animals that the predators are gonna be able to start really taking advantage of that and knocking the numbers down. So logistic growth is when that curve goes from that J shape to be more of an S shape. It's also sometimes called an S curve. And that's because it does sort of look like an S as it levels off towards the top there. Where it levels off and becomes flat, that's carrying capacity. So the total number of animals or plants that an ecosystem can support is the carrying capacity. Um, let's see here. So pop over to, oops. Lost my thing, here we go. Um, so carrying capacity, uh, the limit of individuals the environment can sustain with the given supply of food, water, and space, or competition and predation. So eventually, the animals or plants are going to run out of food, water, space, or they're going to fight with each other for those things um, or be eaten by predators and their numbers are going to level off. And that is what carrying capacity is. Carrying capacity is denoted by the letter K. Now, typically though, uh, like ecosystems, animals don't just hover at that exact flat area when they level off, um, it goes up and down. And so that's what overshoot is. So typically um, organisms are gonna be like, whoa, whoa, we're out of food here. Let's maybe not have as many babies so that we have enough to go around. It'd be really great if they planned things out like that, but it's not exactly how it happens. Typically um, there's gonna be an overshoot. So you're gonna have a population of animals or plants that are gonna grow kind of out of control at that intrinsic rate. And then all of a sudden, you're gonna be short of something, short of one of those resources. And that's what um, overshoot is. So that overshoot is that growing too high um, for what the population can sustain. And then there's gonna be a dieback. And the dieback is often gonna be sort of catastrophic because um, the population ran out of whatever it needs for them to be successful. And a lot of individuals then at that point typically um, die. And let's see, I'm gonna see if I can get a video working here. Not sure if I'll be able to, so let me see. I can figure out how to do this here. All right, 
right, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and then I'm gonna try and do it one more time. All right, so let's see if we can get this going. Let me know if you can hear this video. The periodic migrations of lemmings are an unusual example of how the balance of nature is maintained within an animal population. These lemmings inhabit the bleak tundra of Norway. That Karen, can you uh, hear that video coming through? They breed from spring to fall and in favorable years, even in winter. They live in crevices along rocks or in short burrows under vegetation. A female may have between three and nine young in every litter. Lemmings have a variety of natural enemies that include hawks and wolves. The periodic migrations of lemmings are an unusual example of how the balance of nature is maintained within an animal population. These lemmings inhabit the bleak tundra of Norway. Lemmings reproduce very quickly. They breed from spring to fall and in favorable years, even in winter. They live in crevices along rocks or in short burrows under vegetation. A female may have between three and nine young in every litter. Lemmings have a variety of natural enemies that include hawks and wolves. During normal periods, lemmings make short annual spring migrations in search of food and shelter. Once a suitable area is found, the lemmings settle in and do two things necessary for survival. The first is eating. Lemmings subsist entirely on the roots and shoots of plants. The second thing lemmings do is reproduce. As more and more individuals are born, the food and water supply begins to diminish. Every three to four years, the populations in some localities grow to great densities. In response to this overcrowding, lemmings exhibit a very specialized behavior. Individuals begin to migrate away from the centers of dense population. They group together and move in detectable waves across the countryside. Wherever barriers block their passage, they tend to crowd in increasing numbers until a sort of panic reaction drives them over the obstacles. The migration impulse affects each individual, driving them to keep moving. If a stream or river interrupts their path, they swim across. Many die during migration, perishing by predation, starvation, or accident. Occasionally, some reach the ocean and plunge in. Once again, they begin swimming. They act under the same impulse that forced them to cross smaller bodies of water. Swimming until exhausted, all of them drown. Through this migration and mass drowning, the number of lemmings is checked. Scientists do not yet completely understand how this behavior has continued over the centuries when so many of the emigrating lemmings die. All right, um, hopefully you can see that video. Um, it's just a really good example of what happens when a population does hit that overshoot. Um, and those lemmings, uh, they reproduce very quickly. And it said every three to four years, they overshoot their carrying capacity and they run out of food. So they have to try and migrate to a new area. Um, and then they have this really crazy tendency where they all sort of gather at the ocean and then just jump in and die. And it's sort of strange how they've evolved to do this behavior every three to four years and they're not extinct. Um, they're sort of known for this awkward jumping in the ocean thing, but it's a really good example of animals that overshoot, they get rid of all the resources in their area, and then they they have to have a large dieback in order to uh, sustain a smaller population. Um, let me go ahead and share that original screen again with you. All right, there we go. Um, okay, so yeah, that is um, overshoot, and so that's our little cartoon there of the lemmings uh, giving each other a rating as they're jumping uh, into the ocean. 
But um, so yeah, so that's a good example of overshoot and dieback and what happens in populations um, when they do run out of those resources. Um, because of that, um, the lemmings are another good example. It said, it said every sort of three years they do that uh, overshoot and die back. And what that causes um, are population oscillations. And an oscillation just means that it's going up and down. Um, so these graphs are both showing different populations and how they oscillate. That first one um, is sort of a simple, you can see that the, the blue line here is showing the carrying capacity and how the organisms grow to their kind of um, the carrying capacity, which is the max amount of organisms that can be sustained. But the population in reality doesn't just stay there. It's gonna overshoot and die back, overshoot and die back. Um, and that's often because of what else is going on in the ecosystem. And as we know, there's no ecosystem that stays the exact same every single year. And that change or those changes are going to cause other populations to kind of jump up and down. So if you look at the other one, the kind of yellowish colored one, that is rabbits and lynx or hares and lynx. And that's just a really famous example of how these different populations kind of flow together. So let's say there's a really good year of rain, then you're going to have a ton of grass growing and different things that the rabbits are going to eat. Rabbit population is going to shoot up because that ecosystem carrying capacity goes up. It's now able to hold more rabbits than it normally would because of the increased rain and the increased plants. And then subsequently the same thing happens to the lynx population. It is able to hold more lynx because there's more rabbits to eat. Uh, but eventually the grass is going to die. Maybe next year there's a drought. There's not as much rain. There's not going to be as many rabbits. And then there's not going to be as many lynx. So those uh, oscillations often go with what's going on in the environment, either uh, something that has to do with the weather or something that's going on with a prey item or a predator, or it could even be an introduction of an invasive species or humans or hunting season, different things like that. So um, although we look at population and carrying capacity as being like a straight line, in reality, it's not. In reality, it's an oscillation going up and down over and over again, dependent on what's going on in that environment. All right, so we're gonna look at some factors that influence populations and how they are changing over time based on um, like the different hardships that occur to those populations. So the first one is um, density dependent factors. And density dependent factors um, are something that influence an individual's probability to survive dependent on the size of the population. So that's what we've been talking about. Um, carrying capacity, those are all influenced by density dependent factors. So that's gonna be food, water, um, shelter, space, uh, things like that, maybe predators, that's all gonna be density dependent. Density independent factors are things that have the same probability of impacting an individual regardless of the size of the population. So that's going to be if it's like something that doesn't matter if there's one uh, giraffe there or a thousand giraffes there, they are all going to be impacted um, by something happening. So an example of that would be like a storm. Um, doesn't matter how many individuals are there if a strong storm comes through and damages things or like kills organisms then uh, that so that would be fit in that one um one that's often really confusing is uh disease because it kind of falls under both sometimes it is can be thought of as independent and sometimes thought of as dependent it really depends on sort of the situation so um how close you are to other organisms might make a disease be um, more sus like susceptible to that disease. So um, like we all know, you are much more likely to get sick when you are going to school and you are around a bunch of other students who are sneezing on door handles and you're touching them. Um, so that would be uh, density dependent. Whereas if you just stayed home all day and never talked to anybody, you're not gonna get sick because you're not going outside. Um, but sometimes diseases are things that can move around in ways that aren't necessarily dependent on how close you are to other organisms. So sometimes um, diseases can not, they can be an independent factor. So that one is sometimes you have to really pay attention to the wording of the question or exactly what 
is being asked um, on that and how um, that comes up. Sometimes if it's more of like an um, inherited disease sort of thing, that's a little bit more negotiable, whether it is dependent um, or an independent factor. But for the most part, um, independent things you're going to look at uh, is like storms, volcanoes, things that would just like take out an entire population. Um, doesn't matter how closely together they are to each other. Um, and dependent things are the things that are influenced by carrying capacity, so food and water. Um, all, right. all right, so we're going to do a little bit of review on what we talked about here for carrying capacity and how that is influenced in an ecosystem. Um, so identify all of the following options that are true. Go ahead and post that in the comments section. All of the following of those options that are true. Um, so some populations grow without restraint as long as resources are not limiting. The size of some populations tend to remain relatively constant over time. And some populations, uh, some population size fluctuates in a cyclical pattern and population size may vary in response to an environmental changes. I'll give you just a second and go ahead and post in the comments which one of those or how many of those you think are true. Don't be shy. All right, guys, um, <laughs> you don't have to post it. Um, the, the answer for this is all of them are true. Um, so populations grow without restraint as long as resources are not limiting. Not all populations are gonna grow, again, at their intrinsic rate, as long as nothing's limiting them. Um, the size of populations tend to remain relatively constant over time, um, and that's true. So they're gonna hover around their carrying capacity over time. Um, as long as nothing catastrophic happens, um, it's going to take them out or, you know, um, make the population explode if there's a new introduction of a new resource or something. Um, populations fluctuate in a cyclical pattern. Cyclical means like uh, circles. So that would be that up and down circles around carrying capacity. So that is also true. Um, population size will vary in response to environmental changes. Um, absolutely, if there's a drought and there's no more water, you're gonna see a population crash. Or uh, if there's a new nutrient introduced into the environment, you might see a, a huge algae bloom and that's gonna set off the whole ecosystem and everything's gonna grow, populations are gonna get higher. So um, environmental changes really are the base of what is supporting that ecosystem and will change the size of it. That's going to try. Um, identify all of the following that are true again. Um, in an ecosystem's carrying capacity, sorry, an ecosystem's carrying capacity for a population is determined by space, energy, water, food, or climactic events like storms. So an ecosystem's carrying capacity is determined by space, energy, water, food, and climactic events. And then I would pick all that are true. All right, for this one, um, A, B, C, and D are true, um, and E is not. And the reason for that, if you go back to what we were talking about with density dependent and density independent factors, is the top four are density dependent factors. So those are things that are going to help determine what the carrying capacity in that environment is. Um, and a storm is independent, so that is just gonna, um, take everybody out regardless of the population. So that's um, that one doesn't count for carrying capacity, but the rest do. And you may have gotten stumped uh, a little bit there by B with energy. And is that a some density dependent factor or not? And think about it um, as far as like food chains or food webs, that's where everything starts. So the amount of energy that's coming into an ecosystem is going to set everything off and start the amount of plant growth and that is going to then set the 
limit of food that you have for a population to grow down the line, whether that's herbivores or much farther down. Um, so a population that is living up in the Arctic that has a lot less energy coming in from the sun is going to have smaller populations or ability to support smaller populations than a um, like the uh, tropical rainforest that is getting a ton of energy from the sun and able to support much, much more populations as they are um, in that area. So again, um, energy is going to be part of that uh, uh, density dependent factor and influencing the carrying capacity of the population for those guys. All right. So I think that that is all that we had to go over today for carrying capacity and how that affects um, a population and the organisms living in there. And I would like to open it up for any questions about carrying capacity. We still have some time. All right, guys. Well, if there are no questions um, or nothing else that we want to go over for populations and carrying capacity, then we can go ahead and call it here. Um, if there's anything else that we can talk about, I think we're probably good. Um, all right, thank you guys so much for joining me today. Um, thanks for coming to be part of Fiveable, and hopefully this helped you um, a little bit in understanding carrying capacity and what determines that in an ecosystem. All right, thank you so much.